James, thanks so much for coming back on um, on the podcast. This is um, I think I didn't think we'd be saying this a, a year ago since we last um, last spoke. Us two traveling down to uh, to your office, and I think well, first off, can I just say I really there's two things I want to say. I really needed this conversation this more well today because um, this morning I've been completely fine this whole period of three weeks, but this morning for some reason. I, my head just went. I've just, I've, I've been miserable all morning for some reason. I don't know what's happened to me. And secondly, like I said to you before, is ever since our conversation, and Andy might have a, a, another thing to add on to this, is ever since our conversation a year ago, I thought to myself, I need to do something a little bit more sort of uh, adventurous, if you like. And, and I said to you, I booked my paramotoring course, which I would be going on in two days um, oh, in, like, oh. in Spain. Um, so, it's it's a pleasure to have you back on, mate. And I think I, actually after our conversation, me and Andy had a, a a phone call on the way up, and I think Andy mentioned about potentially rowing across the Atlantic with Ian. Was it? Yeah, yeah, mate. It was impossible after our last chat not to be inspired to want to go and do something crazy. I mean, it was. Are you thinking got... about rowing across the Atlantic, mate? We can talk about <laughs> that. I can. Yeah. No problem. My my big problem <laughs> is. Um, after speaking to yourself about, obviously, you said the hardest thing is getting the boat in the water. And um, the hardest thing for me yeah, is getting... It is. Ian, it is. Ian who is married, yeah, he's the, the, very the much the dumb. So it's trying to get his, um, his wife on board. We're letting him go away for a couple of months. That's the biggest problem. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. The hardest part is getting to the start line. Once you get out there, you'll love it. it it'll be amazing. Uh, yeah. yeah but me <laughs> that, mate, in the crikey, that's a distant memory now. Yeah, well, you, after our last chat, you know, me and Tom came away from it. And it was just, again, it was just impossible not to be inspired to want to go and do something with your life. And you almost felt a bit like, I mean, listen, I'm, I'm someone who I, I'd say I've achieved quite a bit in life, but even I come away thinking oh, I have done fuck literally. all my life. <laughs> no way. That's not, that's not quite the case. <laughs> nah, you're very inspiring, mate. And like Tom said, it was, it was always a goal, goal of ours to get you back on just to hear about your, your latest adventure. I I I, were, I really wanted to do this. I wanted to get you guys down uh, to the airfield, and we all go flying and just have fun and, and like shoot something crazy when we're up in the air. But we'll have to do that in a few months' time later on in the summer when things get back to normal. So, um, but yeah, I mean, to be honest, I can't really believe that in the last year I've somehow flown around the world. I mean, that's gone now, and now we're sat here. And in, in this like global pandemic and you're kind of hardly allowed to go outside apart from, you know, a little bit. And, it, and if you, if we had thought that we had been in this position a year ago, I'd say, no way, you can't even make it up. But you just don't know what's around the corner, do you? And I heard, I was, I heard someone the other day um, say, I mean, it was a little bit morbid, but they were like, if you died tomorrow or of COVID, and hopefully that's not too uh, sensitive for, for people. Would you be happy with the life that you've led and, and the things that you've managed to achieve? And I thought, shit, that's actually a really good, good point. Um, and, and yeah, you just, you don't think that we never would have known that we'd be in this position and, and all these unfortunate people have, have, have passed away and it's affected a lot of people. I've seen loads of people online who, who I went to school with on Facebook and, their, their brothers and sisters have, have died. It's it's bad, but uh, yeah, hopefully it'll sort itself out soon. Um, and yeah, and, just, and just before, before, before just before we we uh, we hit record, you were talking. Obviously, you're um, writing your book now, and I mentioned. I mean, what an incredible time it is to write a book because you can't, you don't have fear of missing out of anything, really, do you? <laughs> no, no. I mean, like to be honest, even if there was no lockdown, I'd still have to be disciplined to 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 be here and, and write in the book anyway so and i'm currently writing about we never got a chance to talk about this when we were together i don't think but i was i'm now writing i've just finished writing about the pedalo across the atlantic ocean um and i'm now writing about the amazon jungle that's why the story of the coffee uh what i mentioned to you a second ago came up and i was, I was saying it to andy um but yeah just just kind of got to i'm got to get my head down really and get this book written so regardless of whether i can go out or not i'd still be here anyway so 
And are you I writing think it's about you, or have you got writing. a writer? No, I'm writing it myself. Um, I say writing it myself. I'm, I'm physically writing it myself. And then I send the words that I've written to an editor. She'll go through it and tidy it up a little bit. She doesn't really rewrite it, to be honest. She'll just say, that's crap. Um, take that out. Or this is quite interesting. Go into more detail on that. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how it works, really. I didn't... Like, the last book that I wrote, I, I wrote that myself. Um, and I wanted to do this one myself as well. So, yeah. What about yourself? You Did you write yours? As well? You wrote yours yourself, didn't you? No. <laughs> <laughs> there was no way. I was... Um, my B in English wasn't, wasn't going to be good enough to write a book. So, I had one of my best friends. <laughs> him, he... Um, he was a ghostwriter, so we used to just meet up for a beer, I'd have one or two beers, put a dictaphone in front of us, and then I would just yeah. pour my heart out. And you know, a couple of weeks later, he'd come back and say, "What do you think of that?" You and could argue that. Probably, yeah, you could argue that that's probably the best way to do it because if you've got this great story to tell, and your friend has this ability to a very good command of the English language and has this ability to help share the story, that's probably the best way to do it. And it's also um, similar, yeah, to, you know, no. it's similar to what your editor was doing, though, because I would say something, and there was part of the story <laughs> I didn't think were that important, and then he would say, oh, tell me more about that. So I guess there's, there's part of your story from, whether it be the Atlantic or flying around the world, could be part of your story that you think, oh, that was just a normal day, whereas someone listening to you or, or reading it would be like, wow, this is, this is incredible. Did I, and I've got a really great example of that. Did I tell you the story um, when I rode across the Atlantic? I had, it, did I tell you the story of the men's magazines? Can yeah, this, yeah. this ring yeah, a bell? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was. I told you that story. Yeah, that, yeah. So that's why you need an editor. Because yeah. I'm so stupid. I will write something that I think is really funny. And probably you and most other guys would think it's funny. But it's just not right for, for the book and the, yeah. some of the audience that are reading it. So yeah. that's when an editor is like worth their remember, waiting. I remember when um, when I wrote down, I wrote down a like a page full of bullet points that I thought might be interesting things for my story. And I don't even know if you know this, Tom, but I was once on a game show uh, on ITV called Red or Red or Black that was hosted by Anton Deck. Yeah, you mentioned this. Yeah, and you got to win a million pounds. <laughs> I was kind of writing down, thinking I've been on Red or Black. That'll be an interesting story. And Phil was like. It's just a game show. It's just a stupid game show on a Saturday night. No one really cares. Um, <laughs> again, I was thinking that might be a cool story, but didn't even make the book. So well, that's quality. <laughs> James, yeah, I've got I, quite a few more. Sorry, carry on. No, I was just going to say. So, could um, I'm I'm really interested about obviously flying around the world. So. Can you just remind us, where did all, because we did speak about this last time, which when we did record was, uh, I think about March, well, it would have been March 2019, I think. And you were a few weeks away from setting off. Just remind um, people who, who haven't listened to that first episode, how, how this whole flying around the world in the gyrocopter happened. Okay. Well, I was coming off the back of a lot of things that hadn't gone my way. Um, I'd been rescued in the Indian Ocean when the boat rolled over. I then went and pedaled across the Atlantic, but that actually didn't have a particularly good ending because the guy that I took across was, was unwell as well. I then tried to row a boat around the coast of Great Britain as a solo rower, and that's quite difficult. It's quite technical, and, I, and that didn't work out. So... Uh, I was coming off the back of three things that, that hadn't really gone my way. I was pretty down and fed up. And I don't know what it was. I kind of felt like I owed it to myself to carry on doing the things that I enjoyed. Um, and I just, uh, ever since I was young, I've always had an interest in flying, but um, I never thought I would be able to. I always thought flying was for people that are very wealthy or people that are very intelligent. And I'm really not that smart. I left school with no qualifications at all. So I thought that pretty much put, put me out. But I, I saved up and I thought, well, why don't I at least try and, and learn? So I wanted to do something a little bit different because I like trying to be a bit different. And so I thought, well, instead of flying fixed wing aircraft, uh, I'll look at rotary. I couldn't afford to fly helicopters because basically they're far too expensive. They're out of my league but I could afford to fly gyros. 
And um, I, I thought, well, you know what? I'm just going to learn how to fly and, and sort of see how that goes. And then um, my instructor, I picked it up really well and I passed my test in like 42 hours. So like the minimum amount of time, but where I used to race motorbikes, uh, I, I guess I still had a sense of balance and coordination. So I was quite lucky. I picked it up and I, uh, you know, I learned that no one had flown one of these around the world. And I didn't actually initially set off with that. I didn't initially get into it with that, with that idea. It just, it happens over time. You know, a lot of people ask me, where do you come up with these Hairbrain crazy schemes from but the truth is I don't they just evolve over time and I thought well I've learned to fly now and you know this is kind of my job really I, I don't have a real job I'm never going to have a real job again so I need to do something and um, I, I set about um, you know, pulling all the funds in and, and raising sponsorship to fly around the world now that was difficult because I had a guy who said he would back me and I had an aircraft built. I, I may have told you this last time. I yeah, can't you did mention it. I, I, think, it was, I think it was built in Italy, wasn't it, the aircraft? Yeah, that's right. And then initially I couldn't pay for it and I was in a really embarrassing situation. And, but you only find out what someone's really made of when, or what someone's really like when you have to tell them something you know they don't want to hear. And initially I had to tell the guys that I couldn't pay for the aircraft. And, and I explained why. And they were really understanding and said, look, don't, don't worry about it. Everything's cool. They managed to sell it to someone else. And I was kind of at a bit of a turning point, to be honest. I thought, well, uh, this could be a perfect get out of jail card. I could now just say, ah, I'm not going to bother doing it. Uh, I, don't, I wouldn't lose face because you could say, well, I wasn't able to get the funding. But it just kind of didn't feel right. And so I carried on trying to fundraise. And that was when I got uh, got picked up by DHL and a few other companies and then it all, all basically came together. Um, so getting to the start line was, oof, that was the hardest thing I've ever uh, been at somehow able to do. But then all of a sudden, when I got to the start line or getting close to it, and I was supposed to leave in October last year, not last year, the year before, sorry, but I wasn't ready. And I remember that when I met up with you guys last year, I was in this period of, of feeling really nervous. I was really anxious and I got to the start line. It was going to happen. But then the reality kicked in. I thought, shit, I've probably bitten off a bit more than I can chew here because it isn't in with the Atlantic. You don't need to be a particularly good rower. You can get in the boat and go and row across tomorrow. You just, it's about enduring and surviving the environment and getting used to it. The rowing, you can just take it slowly and build up if you're not interested in going really fast. Um, whereas flying is a little bit different. There is no substitute for experience. You can't, does it, you can be the fittest guy going. You can be the most determined guy going. You could be the most badass guy on the planet. But if you have very little flying experience, there's nothing that, that will counter that or make up for that. And so I just had to leave knowing that I would trusting in myself and, and the people that I had around me that I would gain more experience on the go. And sure enough, I did. Um, and to really, really be honest with you, it still hasn't sunk in that I have flown myself on my own in, in an aircraft, a tiny little aircraft around the world. And, and someone said to me the other day, it's like a flying toilet seat. And I've never heard that expression before. I wouldn't have quite said that, but uh, yeah, it's um, like I say, it still hasn't really kind of sunk in, to, to, to be honest. And but I'm, I'm quite lucky because I was sort of feel embarrassed to say this, but I was kind of looking for a way out um, before I left because let me tell you, I was massively out of my comfort zone. I was really anxious. I was really, really nervous, and I was thinking. And this is just how the brain works. It's the same for everyone. I was thinking, how can I get out of this without losing face, without losing my credibility? But that was just my brain kind of messing with me. My heart knew that I had to go and I had to do it. And, and, and I'll tell you what, something sort of happened, something switched, something changed. I, I set off and the, first, the, the flights initially were all quite easy. It was through Europe um very short flights as well and then i got into russia and 
and that was just just incredible. The flights were a lot longer there. The people were, like, the people were amazing. Um, that, that country is brilliant. I'm not quite sure. Uh, Russia gets a little bit of a bad rap with 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 the, with, with the media and on TV, and I can't really comment on the government and how it's run and. But all I can tell you is the people that I met were so kind and I'd, I'd love to go back there. Uh, it, was, it was amazing. Um, and I had that goal, didn't I, to speak in a school in every country. Sorry, sorry to butt in. Just on what you said there, I just thought it was interesting that, um, you know, you said before you were kind of looking for a way out before you started. And th- thankfully, you, you know, I'm embarrassed you to say it, but it was, that's true. But it's such a... I think every human has that thing. I remember doing nowhere near on your scale, but I remember running uh, my first marathon. And because of the stump, the longest I could run was 16, 17 miles. So the last, kind of when I was doing it, it was a bit of a step into the unknown. And I got to mile 21, 22, and I I was barely, I'd gone from doing seven and a half minute miles to 12 minute miles. Um, And it was just, I was in a lot of pain. I was walking a lot. And I was genuinely, as stupid as it sounds, contemplating, like, breaking the prosthetic leg. So I had an excuse to quit and I could say, oh, you know, it was the leg. And it's so interesting how the brain kind of tries to trick you to say, it's okay, just tell people that you've got a sore on your leg or the leg's broken or, you know, I was thinking of all these crazy excuses just just for it to end and not have to do it. So it's so reassuring to know that. You know, you felt similar kind of feelings just before you. You know what? Everyone does. Everyone gets the brain. The brain plays tricks on you big time. And here's the thing: I don't know what you think, but when you get into a position like that, it's it's not a good place to be mentally. And one of the things I've realised over time is, as soon as your brain starts thinking, "How can I get out of this?" and and you almost start to justify your. Um, I know this is the right thing to do I'm having a bad day my run's not going so well I'll break the leg we'll come back another day and it's going to be perfect yeah. it just massively plays tricks on you but one of the things that I've learned is when stuff like that happens you've got to shut that down quick mm-hmm. and just know that it's it's kind of normal and that's going to happen and push through that there was um, yeah yeah it was, it's kind of good to know that I'm not the only one as well I'm the only one yeah <laughs> I tell you what, it's reassuring, it's reassuring that from someone who's, um, you know, rode around the world, well, you know, sorry, and cycled around the world and flown around the world, that even you get the, you yeah. know, the, 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 the need to try and, you know, make excuses that, you know, which is, I suppose, is good for us all, really, James. <laughs> yeah, I think everyone does. And there's, there's only someone, I heard someone say this, and I thought, that's quite a good saying, I might pinch that. And there's only two possible outcomes. You'll either do something, you'll do it, and, and this probably sounds a bit harsh, or you'll create a, a, a story as to why it didn't happen. So it'll either happen or it won't, and that, that, that's it really. And mm-hmm. I, I, like, I owed this to so many people because it was so difficult getting to the start line. There was one guy actually who in the end uh, kind of put a bit more money in to, 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 to get me across the line. Uh, as well as a couple of companies. And I, I, no matter what, I was just never, ever, ever in a million years gonna, gonna let these people down. <laughs> and, and, and something happened, but you know, as I got into the flying, I, my confidence built and in the end, um, I kind of loved it. And when I got to America, like because I'd flown directly across Russia, I needed to fly a certain amount of miles um, otherwise I wouldn't be able to set the record that I wanted to set it's like when I cycled around the world you have to do a certain amount of miles basically and so because I got to America quite a direct way straight across Russia uh, if I'd have gone straight across the country I would have arrived back in the UK short of mileage so I flew through every single state and it was it was just amazing but I had a bit of a time limit because I needed to get back across the North Atlantic. And the way that you do that is to fly up into Northern Canada. To a, I flew to a place called Iqaluit. It's like in the middle of nowhere. You can only fly in, you can't, there is no roads or train or public transport, you can just fly in. 
And then I had to fly to Greenland and then to Iceland and then to the Faroe Islands and then to Scotland and back down. So I was racing through America, flying huge days, like doing 10, 11, 12 hour days of flying. And it doesn't, it doesn't sound like much, but you're, you're, you're running on adrenaline when you're flying this little aircraft. You can't afford to make a mistake. And the best way to describe it is like, when you first learned to drive a car, your first ever lesson, you came home and you are so tired and exhausted because it's, your senses are heightened, it's a new thing, and you're just like massively mentally drained. It was like that every day. And where I was driving in a car on the motorway for 10 hours a day is bad enough, mate. Never mind flying. <laughs> exactly. So it's, and then when I, the, as you know, the opposite to adrenaline is just a complete crash. And I would get into a hotel or wherever I was staying in the evening and I would just be exhausted. And you then, you've got things to do. You have to process the footage from that day because I was trying to make as many YouTube videos and share the journey as I could. So, you know, it was just me editing the videos, getting them up that night. And then was the internet any good? Then I had to go and get some food. And, and when I first set off, to fly around the world every evening in Europe. I was going for a run. I was really active. I, I was like, yes, this is great. And by later on in the trip, all that just went straight out the window. And I ended up being a um, bit of a slob, really. I just sat for six months in an aircraft and just flew the thing like a maniac every day as fast as I could to where I wanted to get. So I could get all the rest of my jobs done that evening and then just go to sleep and then repeat, repeat, repeat. And the cumulative fatigue after a while really, really caught up with me. I was, I was really exhausted. And I was quite lucky. I had a good flight um, sort of handling company that were helping me doing my tracking and getting various permissions and things. And he was saying to me, you've got to slow down. You're, you're pushing too hard. You're pushing too hard. You're going to have a, an accident and I don't want that to happen. And I, but I felt okay and, and I managed to get back. And I, had, I was at a, a, a turning point. I was in a Caluit and I was about to cross over to, to Greenland. So that was, that was my largest flight. It was 500 nautical miles across nothing but water. So there's nowhere to land. If the engine fails, it's unlikely. Yes, someone could technically come and get you, but it's unlikely you'll be seen again. Uh, the water's very cold as well. But you put that out the back of your mind. You have to have a mindset that that engine is never, ever, ever going to stop. And luckily it didn't. But the morning I left to fly to Greenland, I remember my flight handler ringing me up saying, listen, we haven't quite got some of the paperwork back. I don't know whether we should go or not. But there was only one weather window. Had I had stayed there, I would have been stuck there. It was just one day of clear weather. And I remember saying to him, I've got to go. We, we've got to go. And he said, yeah, I agree. Just go and see what happens. So I flew to Greenland with technically just literally turning up. And I was quite nervous when I arrived. And when I, when I actually touched down in, in Nook, which is the capital of Greenland, they, all they wanted to do, I kid you not, all they wanted to do was buy me a beer. And that was it. Because uh, they looked at this aircraft and were like, shit, you have just flown that from, Ka from a Caliwit to here and around the world? You've almost finished? Oh, my goodness. And that was a real turning point for me. If I hadn't have left that day, I probably, because it was coming to the end of the summer season, so the weather changes drastically up in that northern hemisphere. So I needed to get back before the winter came in. And then everything came kind of good after that. I did something crazy. Do you want to know about it? <laughs> so okay I, I i i can tell you this right after uh, i'll probably get in trouble but it's, there's no evident video of him sort of so i was flying down the coast of um san francisco and you're allowed to fly around the golden gate bridge and alcatraz and it was it was a beautiful day okay the sun was shining there was no real wind. There was no real other traffic around. So there was no other aircraft buzzing around. And I flew over Alcatraz. And then I turned around and came back. And I just had the Golden Gate Bridge in front of me. 
and I was looking at it and I was I'm in an R in do I go over it do I go under it now the Golden Gate Bridge I'm telling you is massive the, the clearance between the water and the bridge is, is huge and I thought to myself it was like it happened in slow motion I was looking at it and I thought I'm never gonna be here again I'm never ever gonna be here again I'm never gonna get this opportunity again and I thought well Sometimes it's better to say sorry than it is to ask. And so I turned the transponder off so no one could see me on the radar. Uh, I could just say it was a technical problem. And I came down level with the deck, with the bridge, and my eyes are fixed on the bridge because I'm looking to see if there's any ropes coming down for maintenance. Also underneath the Golden Gate Bridge, they now have suicide nets. Um, so there's, there, there can be stuff there, and I didn't want to fly into that. So I was like, my eyes were fixed on the bridge and I could see there was nothing there. And I just went straight under and came out the other side. And I was like, wow, I was buzzing. My heart, my heart rate was pounding. And I thought, you know what? Um, and I got it all on camera as well, but I've never actually shared the footage publicly. Um, but uh, hey, if that was me, I'd be, I'd be having it everywhere. <laughs> and, well, the problem that I've got is it's a grey area, right? Because helicopters are allowed to fly under the bridge, and I'm sort of I sort of sit somewhere in the middle of being a. I'm not a helicopter, but I'm a rotary aircraft. So I thought, well, I won't share that imagery in case I don't want any. I don't want my actions to 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 then penalise other pilots around. So yeah, yeah. I just kind of did it for my own thing, and I and I thought, well, whenever I do go back to San Francisco. Maybe in years and years and years to come, if I ever have kids or I'm there with someone else, I can say, hey, I flew under that. <laughs> I can say, there's the picture. It's there's a the first page story. And, or um, when, you get a, when you get someone back to your place, maybe just show them on the laptop. That's a good time. <laughs> good time to show them. <laughs> yeah. Mate, on, America, sorry. on that note, maybe what you're saying <clears throat> might sound like a silly question because you're saying about how mentally fatigued you were and how busy you were, but... Were the times to enjoy the social aspect of, for example, America? You know, you're meeting all these people, everyone's great to see you. Did you have time to grab yeah. and, you know, socialise? Yeah, I was able to, like, go out in the evenings to a, to a degree. Um, I stopped off at a big air show. Uh, so the manufacturer came over from Italy. They were there uh, for a week. I was there for four days because I had my aircraft on display. And so... Yeah, I mean, when you're flying around the world, it's just like once you rode across the Atlantic, everyone wants to buy you a beer. So you've got no shortage of people offering to buy you a beer and take you out and stuff. But here's the kind of dilemma that you have, because it's not like a jolly, it's not like a holiday. You're kind of working and you've got these commitments. So every evening, you're kind of obliged to upload these videos and reply to emails and you're looking at the weather for the next day and planning the next day. So the more time that you spent out drinking beer, like I went to Las Vegas. I flew into Las Vegas. It was crazy, crazy. And boy, it was hot as well. And, and I wanted to enjoy it. Like uh, there was loads of guys there on stack parties having so much fun, man. And I thought, oh, I could really do with taking a couple of days off and just having fun. But I couldn't, I had to kind of move on. And that was the problem when you stopped um, and you started hanging out with people and, and, and drinking and having fun. It was difficult to get back into a rhythm, if that makes sense. I think that would be so my hard. Was finding you know, a balance. I just want to meet people and socialize and share the experience more, actually, than I think I yeah. listen to you speak. I think I love the sound of saying you've done it than actually doing it. You know, it'd be. I like the idea of doing it and the, what it would bring and the place you'd go and the people you'd meet. Oh, actually, yeah. yeah. The actual reality of doing it was <sighs> the actual flying from A to B was relatively easy. I, I ended up, in the end, certainly going through America, I was flying to relax uh, because I didn't have to do anything. I would get up in the air um, and it's... Without going into too much technical detail, you, you've got a chart plotter, you know where exactly where you're going. It's like a sat nav for the sky. Um, I didn't really need to talk to any air traffic controllers because I wasn't going through controlled airspace. So that made it easier. And in the end, right, when I flew back across the Atlantic, I was listening to podcasts and stuff on my headset. 
because there's no one to talk to. So when you cross the Atlantic, you're completely out of radio range. So you can relay to airliners, but to be honest, they don't really want to talk to you and there's nothing really to say. Um, so when I flew from Iqaluit to, to Greenland, which was the first part, and then from Greenland to Iceland, I was listening to Elon Musk's audio book and, and it took my mind off the drone of the engine because going back to talking about the mind, the mind plays tricks on you. So you're sat there and all you can hear is this. So you get to hear what the engine sort of sounds like. And if there's one little bit that changes, you're like, that didn't sound right. And then you're kind of like, your mind plays tricks on you. You're expecting, is the engine gonna stop over water? What, what, what do I do? And it never, never did. But, and in the end, I thought, well, why am I worrying? There's no point in worrying about something I have no control over. If the bloody engine stops, then maybe it's my time to go, and that's just life. Um, so I started listening to audiobooks, mate, and it was a brilliant way of killing the time, and it took my mind off it. So I listened to Elon Musk, and I listened to that bloke, uh, David Goggins, who's a bit of a nutter. Yeah, who he I is. <laughs> he's crazy i was listening to some of his stuff <laughs> as i was flying along um and that 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 really kind of helped can but i just actual... add james oh, sorry. You, you, you know um I, th I think i mentioned it last time but when um you you alluded to it earlier about just trying to get through america as quick as you can and um if you've ever watched long way down with um you mcgregor and charlie yeah. Baldwin, when they were going through africa they said that I think they even had an argument between each other that they were so annoyed that they're just rushing through this country just to meet a deadline. Did you ever feel that like you just like, I, I wish, I wish we could just slow this down so that I can enjoy the 52 States of America, you know, and, and, and enjoy going through this rather than just trying to, you know, trying to reach a deadline. Yes, absolutely. I did. But the problem that I had, was I wanted to get around the world in one continuous journey. I didn't want to break it up over years. Um, and so with the small aircraft that I was flying, it was very, I can't really fly in the, in the winter, in, in, in bad weather, in, when it's really, really cold. So I only had a certain, I basically had six months to get around the world. And if I wasn't able to get around the world in that six months, then it, the, the whole thing would probably have to be split over two years, which I didn't really want to do. Um, so that's the, the only reason I flew quite quickly. Mm. Um, and, and you know what? You kind of hit the nail on the head. That was exactly the same when I cycled around the world. I was meeting all these, in really weird situations, I was meeting people in the street as I was cycling, and, 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 and getting all these opportunities that I didn't expect, but you can't really take advantage of them because you're trying, you're trying to hit a schedule. And this is the thing, when you take money from a sponsor, you're working, you have to stick to a schedule because they're trying to promote you and do certain things with it. They're asking, like for example, DHL, I flew into Cincinnati International, which is a massive international airport. It's like Heathrow. Um, and of course they wanted to know when I was going to be there. And it's very difficult giving people ETAs and stuff. So you're flying like a maniac trying to get somewhere quickly so you can get ahead of schedule and know that you're going to be somewhere because you, you're committed to it because you've taken money off these people. So you have to deliver on the expectations that you promised. The best way to do all these things, if you ever had the opportunity to do it, is probably just self-fund it and just enjoy it. And it can be exactly what you want it to be as fast or as slow as you want but i couldn't self-fund it because i didn't have the money to do it so the only way i was going to do it was to to seek all the funding and get sponsorship and it's, uh, it's, 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 james i remember um on, sorry, Tom, i remember nowhere again nowhere near on this scale but i remember going to um climb snowden with a good friend of mine he was also yeah. he used to be in the, the parachute regiment and um We'd done it a few times together and we turned up one. It was a lovely summer's day. Weather was amazing. And we kind of said, right, how long do you think it'll take us to get up and down it? I don't know. I think we said three or four hours or something. Whatever it was, or a couple of hours. I can't remember now. But we basically ran up this bloody mountain and then back down again. And, um, yeah, you know, that was it. And it was only as we were coming down, we were nearly at the bottom. 
we kind of stopped for a little drink and you thought, what was the point in doing that? Like we haven't even, <laughs> we're, in, we're in this amazing, beautiful landscape, you know, highest point in Wales, some amazing views. And you think, yeah. it didn't really, like, you know, people travel all over the country to come and climb <laughs> Snowden, taking the view. Imagine we've gone go for a run around the streets or something for, for yeah, a few hours. And, it was, yeah. and then from that moment on, I've never kind of pushed myself to get it done quick. I always try and take it in and, that's what I can imagine. I mean, then, I'd, like you say, I'd, I'd the responsibility of sponsors, etc., like that, and it becomes even, even less so. And, and actually, talking about like enjoying the journey as opposed to the end, just just going back to when I did row across the Atlantic. I mean, it's a long time ago now, and I won't go on about it too much. But I spent the whole 110 days wishing it away, wanting to get to the other side, and then when I was within 24 hours or well, maybe 48 hours. Of, of Antigua, I was like, oh, I don't want this to end now. And I started to slow up. And over the years, I've kind of learned that it's never really about the end. It's nice to enjoy it at the end, but it's, it's always the journey. You've got to be able to enjoy and look at it as a journey, not just it, the end goal. You know, you know, you say that, you know, and I genuinely mean this, you know, for me personally, it might, might sound a bit depressing this, but wanting to be a Royal Marine, is better than being a Royal Marine, I think. Like, <laughs> no, is it really? Yeah, I, I, yeah I, I've heard a few people say this, that kind of going through Royal Marine training and, and looking up to these people who have got a Green Beret and the right, to, you know, they've got Royal Marine Commando on their arm and, you know, they look like machines and you're like, I want to be a part of that group. And <laughs> don't get me wrong, right. once, you, yeah. once you are a part of that group, it's an amazing feeling and I'm still very proud of it. But I always think it was... That journey of just you know striving to be a part of that elite was was probably just as good, if not better, than actually actually doing it, which is you know similar to what you're saying. Getting there, yeah, yeah, it, yeah it's, absolutely. It's so, the same. Yeah, now I. Sorry, mate. Sorry, it's the same. Um, I mean, with what's going on now, you know, it's like now is such a good time for people to stop and think <laughs> you know you know whether this is good or bad but stop and think about like what what we are doing you know as people and not and you know in trying to enjoy that that um that journey you know rather than just finishing you know trying to trying to head for the finish line because like like both of you both of you two I'm probably as, as guilty as wanting to you know whether it's financial goals or anything like that just reach a certain target as quick as possible and then forget about what happened what's happened you know the, the 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 time before so it's such a good point you know i think everyone think, suffers from that. Think that people will with this whole lockdown now everyone's kind of so eager for it all to be over do you think once it's over people will be thinking i wish we could just have another week of lockdown 100%. yeah no, i guarantee it yeah i guarantee it and this is probably what will happen and i hope this doesn't sound harsh but you'll have two types of people right now the people that just go okay and accept it and then actually they, they're quite smart because they find ways to adapt. They start uh, shifting the way they do things with their, their business or whatever it is so they can keep it going. They use the time wisely to come up with new ideas and, and be ready to, to do new things when all this lockdown is lifted. And then you will just have the people that just sit there all day and their brains will go off on a wild roller coaster of emotions and they'll be just a complete wreck. Um, and also as well, this whole lockdown thing is, is an, uh, kind of exposing people. And what I mean by that is you're now, if, you, if you're a single guy or a single woman or you don't really have anyone around you, you're now on your own. There is no one to, you can't escape your own reality. You can go out for a walk or a run or a bike ride, but sometimes when people are on their own, um, you know, that's when they figure out who they really, really are, not who they wish they were. And sometimes uh, a reality check can be quite a harsh thing, but there'll be, you know, uh, there'll be good things that come off the back of it, really. Uh, but the, the, I mean, I, when I was in the Atlantic or whenever I was away on any of these trips, it was different because I wanted to be there and you want it. That's whereas people aren't choosing to be locked up. So it's, you did know... You have, it, on your journeys, did you have any moments, whether it was the, the cycling or the flying or the rowing? I mean, 
you, you're a guy who's, who's been on his own a lot. Did you ever have kind of moments where, like this epiphany of, you know, something, wow, this is me, or this is, you know, all the time you spent on your own? Was there any profound moments? Uh, I missed my parents, because uh, they're my good friends, actually. I'm quite close to them. And I missed some of my friends. Apart from that, I didn't miss anything else at all. And I, I did miss having a clean shirt and staying in a, in a clean bed with clean sheets and, and being fresh and wearing nice eau de toilette and smelling nice. That's all I missed. I didn't miss anything else. It's really simple things that you miss, um, for me anyway. Mm. Um, but it's I think different the, because I wasn't, I it's not that, like I was in yeah, no, the I was, reason I asked is I think that people, um, I done a Q and A yesterday actually with someone, and she she basically said any any advice from lockdown, and I I just kind of said to people not to be so hard on yourself because I think a lot of people are thinking within this lockdown that they're going to come up with this new me and this new way of life, and, and hopefully there are some positive yeah, things. But I think yeah. I think people think that this time on their own there's going to be this huge reset button and something miraculous is going to happen. There's going to be this profound moment, but that's why I was keen to ask you, you know. Or have you ever had one of those moments? Because sometimes there's there's not one of those moments, is there? Yeah, that is a good good point. Some uh, I was so focused on what I wanted to achieve that I didn't really have any kind of moments like that. To to, to be honest, um, so no, I mean I was I was okay. I, I, I'm kind of quite used to my own company. Mm. Um, really, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I know exact. I know exactly what I'm going to do after this is all all done. Is that I can imagine myself in a You're year's time. Free. Yeah, well, yeah, fucking do right. <laughs> but in um, I, I'll it, in a year's time from this, we'll all be crazily busy. We'll forget about all of this, and I'll think back to the time like I'll have a really shit long busy day, and I'll think, God, what what would I do to have that? Be back in yep. April with no nothing on the calendar whatsoever, and uh, but yeah. This, this is a bit like the analogy that we were talking about, enjoying the journey. Right now, everyone is in lockdown, and all they want to do is get out of it, get out of it. And then when it comes, they'll be like, mm. oh, yeah, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad at all. And then I you'll be wishing you are back in it yeah. to have a day off. <laughs> That's what will happen. I follow a girl on Instagram. Um, her name's Lydia, and she does this. She's like a health and well-being kind of coach. And she she done a great post the other day, and I thought it was so true. And she said, you know, Stop saying that you're bored. You know, bored is such a negative word anyway. Start looking at it as you've got this time yeah. to put your phone down, get off bloody YouTube and stop get off social media and just reflect on on you and how you are and, you know, your own well-being and your own mindset and just sit and, you know, relax. Don't say you're bored just because you're not, life's not 100 miles an hour. And, and that, that word's got a connotation of just being yeah. upset and miserable, hasn't it, being bored. So kind of use this time to think, you know what, just just the time to slow down. Yeah, I, I, and I, I, I totally agree with that. And actually someone said to me I was bored, they were bored the other day, and I had to bite my tongue because uh, I'm, I'm kind of conscious I would never want to upset anyone, but I wanted to say, mate, get a dream. You, you shouldn't be telling me you're bored. You should be telling me you're so busy working on this, 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 and this, because that's what you want to do. Mm. And, and, and I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm sat here writing a book. I'm doing this. I've got a new website going up and I'm planning my time. Why aren't you doing the same? But then I had to stop myself saying that because everyone is different and, and he's a plodder. He just plods along. So he's yeah. never going to be that super motivated guy <laughs> who's like, right, next, 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 next. And everyone's different, aren't they? You know? <laughs> well, yeah, you're totally right in what you say. And what I think is really interesting is, obviously me and you work in a similar type of line with the public speaking, but, he, but Tom obviously had an interesting podcast and that's how we got to know each other. And I think there are certain types of people who, whether it's for a job like me and you or Tom as a hobby, kind of invest themselves in, in people and getting to know interesting stories and getting to, you know, allow themselves to be inspired and motivated and hearing, hearing interesting stories. So I think three of us are similar in that mindset. In, in our normal life. And I think what this lockdown has done, I'm hoping, is open people's eyes to see that you, you can also get to know these types yeah. of people and, and see this type of living. Because let's let, let you say your friend there, a plodder, 
some people are, are in the nine till five. They come home. They've got kids to look after. They've got whatever, and they don't really have time to invest into looking into James Ketchell's life and James Ketchell's challenges or Tom Wickstead's podcast. And it's just normal life for them. So it's not that maybe I think they don't want to. It's just I think they they can't. And I'm hoping that this lockdown can have you know an impact on people where they maybe got a glimpse of maybe this podcast or, or hear about your story or or think why don't I you know check this guy out and it comes back to then you're a product of your surroundings and I, I'm hoping that people can see that there is another way to live your life rather than just plod along in your nine till five. You just hit the nail on the head with something you just said there. You are who you hang around with and you're you're right. It's just if you if you're around other people that are kind of got some get up and go that usually does rub off on on that person as well so yeah well that was one of the big reasons with wanting to do the podcast with tom i knew if i was doing the podcast on my own you know it's just if someone cancelled on you know you i had child minding issues and it got cancelled to the next day it's you suddenly then oh it, it doesn't really matter whereas if you do it with someone who's committed and motivated like tom is and it holds you to account it's that bit of a rock, and you can, and then you, you bounce off each other. Yeah. And it, it makes it far more successful rather than just. I think you need to be far more disciplined doing something on your own, you know, because you've got to push yourself. Whereas if you team up with someone with similar mindset and, and they can push you, it's it's a recipe yeah. for success. Yeah, mate, I, I I totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah, that yeah. Account, that accountability partner thing is so important. Like for us, you know, not not just podcasting, but <laughs> but in uh, you know, in everything. And that's why I suppose people who who were really into exercise team, you know, you know, people team up with or sorry, not people who are really into exercise, people who are struggling with exercise, a lot of the time team up with people, don't they, to get that accountability. And I know, Andy, you're a big um, that saying that you always say, um, you know, if you surround yourself with with nine idiots, don't be surprised if you become the tenth. <laughs> Which is become so the tenth. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so true. It is. It is. Yeah, <clears throat> James. Can I? Can I ask? So, one thing that have is, you got... uh, go on, mate. Go on. You go. Oh, sorry. Bit slight delay there. I was going to say, have you read a, a fantastic book by Napoleon Hill called "Think and Grow Rich"? Yeah, he talks I'm... about putting a mastermind group together and and. That, that's 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 quite a big thing, and um, you know, getting a group of people together, like-minded people, to sort of hold each other accountable and 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 to kind of push each other, and that's that's quite a useful thing, actually. Yeah, it's a. I think that book was written about early 1900s. I think it was a long, long time ago. That book um, was written, but what I wanted, what I want, what I wanted to correct it was. What I wanted to ask you, James, was um, one thing that struck me when I was thinking about. Uh, our conversation today is when you're initially you were going to go if my if my memory serves me right initially you were going to go through um obviously through europe but then through parts of india and then singapore and philippines and that way round round yeah. round the world but obviously that changed due to visa issues etc how on earth did you find in the middle of say outer mongolia or kazakhstan places to land and actually fuel and places to stay um, which part of it as well mm. <laughs> that wasn't that wasn't too bad because i had a flight logistics support team that helped uh every time i took off i knew where i was landing so i had like a russian agent which sounds very james bond it, it's not he was the the his name was evgeny really nice guy and so he planned all the stops through russia uh, and then i had a guy back in the uk making sure everything was in place as well so um it wasn't it, it wasn't it was, it was actually relatively simple to to be honest and the whole reason why i didn't fly the other way and you've got a good memory there tom is because pakistan shut their airspace down and not even british airways were routing through pakistan and that was the only way i could go if i was to go that way like through asia and india and, and that so that then forced the change to go across Russia. And it was probably for the best, really. It was, it was, it was a lot easier, actually. But the, the language thing was, was interesting because when you're in Moscow, that's like being in a nice big European city. Everyone speaks English. But as you get further out, um, 
yeah, not so many people speak English. So quite often or not, I had to use the, the telephone to call Evgeny and, and say, can you, you know, and I'll just put the other guy on the phone and he'd be the translator over the phone. But everyone that I met, regardless of whether they could not speak the language or not, they knew what I needed, fuel, accommodation, food, and it was all arranged. So I prepaid for the fuel before I even went. So actually Russia was, was pretty simple, to be honest, um, but it was all very controlled. So I could only take off at a certain time. When I took off, I had to be speaking to air traffic control. Because I was flying quite low, I lost them. So I then had to relay my position to commercial airliners above me, and they would relay my position to the ground controllers. And that's how I was passing messages. And I remember I was out in like Siberia, it was in the middle of nowhere, and I heard a, a British accent. And he'll say, so the, the code for a British Airways flight is Speedbird. So on the radio, they'll say Speedbird 1234. And you know that's a British Airways flight. And I heard uh, a British accent and it felt amazing to be halfway around the world and hear this British accent and know that guy is flying a British Airways flight like 25,000 feet above me. It felt really cool. Um, yeah, but no, Russia was, was amazing. But when, you, when I got to the last stop, so I flew from Russia into Alaska, across the Bering Straits. Uh, I was in a place called Providenia. And years and years ago, people in Russia were told where they were to live. They were told, you're going to go there. Uh, it was like all the Soviet era time. Um, but then those restrictions were lifted and people could, were free to, to do what they want. And, and, and years ago, people were sent away to Siberia, to, to these jails and stuff. And all the, um, the derelict buildings are still there. It's like the most ultimate film set you'd ever see in your life. It was incredible. Um, but they were not so keen on me filming and I asked to film and they say, no, 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 no. But they were able to film me, you know, so um, no, it was, yeah, Russia was wicked. You know what you're saying about <clears throat> going to derelict places? We had um, a guy similar to yourself who drove across the Atlantic and he said that the, um, the scariest time of his, his life, he said it wasn't so much being alone and he said he can cope with being scared, but it was being alone and scared at the same time. Were the times where, well, two questions, were the times where you were alone and felt alone and scared flying? And second question, what was more scarier, the Atlantic or the flying? The Atlantic wasn't scary ever. Um, the flying, <laughs> the, the Atlantic wasn't. It was, the Atlantic was amazing. Like, and and I, think you sh I think you two should do it. It'd be amazing. Oh, no. uh, um, uh, there were a few times when I was flying and when I thought, oh shit, what am I going to do? Um, and I'll tell you a very quick story. When I, I got caught out by bad weather once because getting the weather forecast is really important because if you fly into bad weather, that could, I mean, it could take you out of the sky if it's that bad. But with the apps and the new forecasting technology that's on the internet now, it's really easy. It's very straightforward. But there was one time when I flew from Kulasuk to uh, Reykjavik, which was 400 miles. So it was from Greenland to Iceland. And the weather forecast suggested there was going to be some low cloud, a little bit of rain. But it wasn't that, like, really that bad. Like It was going to be more than flyable. And when I got up and I was, by this point, I was committed. I was almost halfway across. There's no turning back. I am going to Iceland no matter what. Otherwise, I crash trying. Um, and then the cloud just kept coming lower and lower and lower to the point where I was flying about a hundred feet off the ground and I could barely see where I was going. I was using, I was actually using the instruments. I had an artificial horizon on the aircraft. So that told me that I'm the right way up. I'm not going left. I'm not going right. I'm not going to crash down into the water. And at that point I thought, oh shit, I, I, someone please whoever's looking down on me just look after me and I have never been so pleased to see land in my life and here if there was ever a 
someone looking down on you, you know it when this happens. So I arrive back into Reykjavik, okay? Um, it's pouring with rain. Rain, because my cockpit's open, it doesn't have a roof. I don't have a cabin, I've just got a screen. So rain is coming down inside. All the instruments are getting wet. So I've got a little hand towel drying the instruments because I don't want anything electrical getting wet, obviously. And I look up and I see the airport and to the left and to the right of the airport was thick cloud down to the ground. You never would have been able to go into that. And the only clear bit, there was a tiny clear bit and that was where the runway was. And so I went in and landed and I thought, Jesus, thank you. And that was the only time I've ever been a, a little bit scared. <laughs> yeah. And apart from that, it was straightforward. <laughs> I do. I, I I know Reykjavik's notorious, isn't it, for low cloud? Um, people flying into there. Yeah. It's just... yeah, yeah, yeah. It... Tom, you it's are a of... clever bastard. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I just, know it, it, of everything. Yeah, it's um, <laughs> yeah. Iceland is. Uh, I'd, I'd love to go. I've never been to. Uh, I've never been to Reykjavik, but I would uh, would would love to go. I, I'll tell you where you want to go, uh, which is a lovely little place and more often or not people probably wouldn't think to go there but i would go to the faroe islands the faroe islands are just beautiful really rugged jagged and just these masses of rock that protrude and stick up out of the ocean and there's people living there it's, it's incredible and, and actually, that was, that was one of the landings where I was a little bit nervous because they have notoriously bad cloud. And cloud is not good in a light aircraft because you can become disorientated very quickly. Um, and I was really worried about, about that. But the day that I left, the weather was perfect. And, but then I got stuck in the Faroe Islands for a week because do you remember the hurricane that come through? Hurricane Doran smashed up America and then made its way over. And, and we kind of got hit a little bit by it. Well, that passed through the Faroe Islands and I was stuck there for a week. And then after that, I flew down into Scotland. But by that point, it was only when I landed in Iceland after that crazy flight that I thought, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Because every time I flew, I just took it one flight at a time. I had so many flights. I think I flew like 135 flights or something like that. It was loads. And each time I took off, I just thought it's one more small flight. It's one more small flight. And, all, and because it blows your mind when you think of it as a whole, like you're going to fly around the world. It doesn't matter who you are. That will blow your brain apart. It's too big a task to kind of understand and comprehend. So I just thought it's one little flight. And all it was is load of small flights stitched together that, that got me around the world. And that's kind of how I broke it down in my head. And I just took it one day at a time. And it wasn't until I, I started coming back across the North Atlantic that I thought, wow, I'm, I'm going to really do this. Yeah. Hey, have you ever thought about opening up a travel company? You're, you're probably one of the most traveled men I will have ever met. Certainly, you know, you must, you must know travel advice, travel tips, places to go most beautiful places, most picturesque places, best beer to get. You should, um, you should. Do yeah, probably, I could probably do it right, couldn't I? I'd quite like to, and I've done a little bit in this in the past. I would quite like to do a little bit of like private, private stuff, you know, taking a very, very small group of people away. I used to take people out to Everest base camp, um, but I don't really do that anymore. Um, I don't know if I'd want to all run a big company as such. Could be a pain in the ass. I'd like to take people away that I like and get on well with. And but I'm so stupid. I, like, I'm not really a money person. I wouldn't. I'd feel bad charging people. I'd just say, "Yeah, come on. I'll show you the best places ever that no one ever has seen ever, and I'll share them with you." Just because I think it's a nice thing to do, and I'm passionate about travel and people. But you can't really do that. Like you, you need. I mean, so. I, I don't really have the mindset for, mm. for, for probably having a business like that because I just give everything away for free and say, come on, it's great. So I just, yeah, I never really thought of it. But <laughs> what, what has been, out of interest, what has been your most favourite place, whether that's been just a personal experience you've had, the people you've met, or whether it's just the landscape and the beauty, what's been your overall Probably 
Nepal is beautiful. The mountains, the jagged mountains that just sit there, ah, they're just amazing. And the people as well. The, the Nepalese people are some of the nicest you'll ever meet as well. And I think because I had lots of memories and, you know, I, I somehow dragged myself to the top of the world and then descended with a bloody pneumonia, which I didn't realise at the time, which caused it to be very difficult. Uh, it means I have a lot of memories of that place. So, yeah, that, that, that's a beautiful place. James, what's, what's Nepal like? Because obviously when you land, it's, I imagine it's full of climbers. So it must be such, a, like, such an interesting place because you've got all these like, extreme people there that are obviously there to, 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 to summit Everest. In because it, it's it is a poor country as well. Just it must be such a weird like crossover. Uh, yeah, when you land in Kathmandu, there's just millions and millions of people everywhere. Just regular people going about their day to day business. Uh, when you land in a place called Lukla, which is on the way up the Everest Base Camp Trail, that's when there's lots of climbers and hikers. Yeah, it's good. I don't know what it's like now. But I do believe it's quite busy now. So maybe the feel, the same feel that I had nine years ago, or I've been back there since, uh, is not quite the same. I don't know. Mm. But um, yeah, when I was there, there was a great buzz. Everyone was happy. Everyone was just taken in this magical place. Um, and although it's quite, it's quite a busy place now and, and and some people would say well the magic of of just going to Everest base camp is is now no longer there i would disagree I, I think it's still an amazing place and if you ever get the opportunity to to go out there i would do it but it's not just the the trek up to Everest base camp there's loads of other mountains there's loads of other trails and quite often or not people are now going off the beaten track a little bit more um so that that's yeah that's a pretty cool place uh, I, I remember I, I can't remember where i saw it but they i think of what f some rich americans were doing is they can pay thirty five thousand dollars, i think it was each to go start the climb up to everest and this guy was on his way up there who was a professional climber i can't remember i saw it on a documentary and they'd they just paid to walk up this obviously everest and and he was getting so frustrated because there was loads of these people that had just paid an obscene amount of money to start to try and climb it but then had to come down straight away because they just weren't fit enough and yeah it can happen yeah which um so yeah i suppose it is getting commercialized think, isn't it but, but yeah now the, the, you have there's two separate things there's trekking to Everest Base Camp and then there's actually trying to climb the entire mountain to get to the top. So the two things are very different. 90% of the people out there, because uh, you can only really climb Everest, there's only really one proper season. Um, and, and, and so, really, 90% of the people out there are just walking to base camp or just trekking. It's only a very small percentage that are actually going to the top, and that'll be through the probably through the spring climbing season. But it's busy out there, yeah. yeah. Mm. On the north side, if you go to Everest Base Camp via the north side, via Tibet, you can actually drive up there. There's, there's a road up to, to Everest Base Camp. But I've never been there. It's, it's a bit different. <laughs> hey, on, just on you talking about uh, Everest, it's, and I hate when this question gets asked to me, so I apologise for asking it to you. But what, what, what next now? I mean, before you answer that, I, I, I felt kind of... I, I always feel sometimes that once I broke the 10k record and I, I climbed a few mountains, not unlike yourself, but you know, and, and I've done various things, I kind of thought like I'm, I'm you know, I've, I've done a bit now. You've done far more than me. You've, you've rode the Atlantic, you've climbed Everest, you've you've cycled around the world, flown around the world. At what point or where? Well, a few kind of questions rolled into one. You know, where do you get the motivation to keep on going and doing more? And, and, and what else is there to do? I mean, what more can, can you do? Do you want to know something really exciting? <laughs> there is a lot more. Now, I'll tell you something really interesting. There's no human being on this planet. I have to be careful with it, else I'll get, shoot myself in the foot, but it doesn't matter. There's no human being on this planet who has circumnavigated the globe via air, sea, and land. 
So I've already cycled around the world. I've already flown around the world. Yes, I've rowed a boat across the Atlantic, but I haven't circumnavigated the globe on water. So in 2022, I am working on another project to sail around the world. But this is where it has a little bit of a twist. There's no real value in me just doing these things now. Um, Cause what is, what else is some, what is someone else going to get out of this? If, if I'm just doing things, they might enjoy watching me, but that's about it. So when I go around the world in 2022, uh, I'm taking a group of ex offenders away with me. I'm not talking about hardened murderers and you know, bad people. We're talking about people that are between 18 and probably 23 that that kind of age group so he's still young people who have through no real fault of their own have got in with the wrong crowd and they're good they have potential but they're with, they've got the wrong people around them they've got no one really mentoring them and guiding them in life through whatever reason or not perhaps they're just just unlucky circumstances and so i'm gonna work with an organization to identify these these young people and I'm going to bring them on board the boat and we're going to sail it around the world in stages. There'll be about seven stages. It will be continuous as in I won't come home until I've sailed around the world. And for each stage, there'll be three to four guys and, and women that will come onto the boat and they will sail it with and they'll become part of the team. And the idea is uh, that this project gives them something to look forward to, become a part of give them a sense of belonging that they perhaps wouldn't ordinarily have. Also get them away from perhaps uh, an area or people that they need to get away from and give them something to, to be proud of and, and, and uh, hopefully puts them on the right trajectory in life as opposed to the, the, the wrong one. So um, there's no real public information on this because I haven't, sh I'm only like chatting with you guys on the podcast. Um, but uh, that's, that's what I'm working on next. Uh, it's a big project though. I've got to raise a lot of money, but I'll, I'll do it. I've never ever failed to get to the start line. I've had things go wrong. Like I was rescued in the Indian ocean and yeah, stuff's gone wrong, but I've always got to the start line when I've put my mind to it. But this is bigger than I've ever, ever really worked on. It's, it's big money. You know, I need to raise close to a million quid. But it's possible. There's a lot of opportunity out there. And yes, this whole lockdown corona thing is going to have an impact on sponsorship. But it will come back. And the type of people I'm targeting, this won't affect anyway. Uh, so, um, well, yeah, there's, made, there's not only... You know, is it a huge personal achievement to you? It's so great to hear that you're, you're giving back and setting an example to so many young people as well. That's that is a unbelievable challenge, mate, and fair play to you. It's that's it's super to hear that you're doing that. The reason this came about was because when I flew around the world, I spoke in a school, and, and all that went fine. But there was one school in particular uh, in France where the headmaster said, "Do you want to? Do you want to? Are you up for a challenge?" And I was like, "Yeah, okay." And he said, there's a school around the corner and this is a school for naughty boys and girls. They either go to jail or they come here. He said, I don't know how this is going to work. It may not work, but let's try it. And I went into this school and some of them spoke English, some of them didn't. So I spoke through a translator and I gave a standard talk and it, and it went well. And, and they had the option of staying on and asking me questions or they could go and have their free time. And not one of them got up and left for their free time. They kept asking me how I got into this and loads of different questions. And the guy said to me, this has never, ever happened before. We've never had anyone come in here and, and been able to capture their imagination and attention like this. You've got a gift. You're very lucky. And I left and I didn't really think too much of it initially. But then I flew the rest of the way around the world. And I thought, how many people are there out there like that, that are good people they have a good heart, but everyone makes mistakes. Everyone does stupid things. I do. I did when I was a kid. Everyone does. And I thought, wouldn't it be a great opportunity to work on a project to help those types of people? And that's how, like, I didn't wake up one day and say, right, I'm going to sail around the world and take ex-offenders. 
and this is how everything that I do happens. It just evolved and it feels right. So that's what I'm working on now. And you, and so, and you had another question because I wrote it down. It was like, uh, what's your motivation to carry on? And, and the truth is, this is what makes me feel happy. And this is what makes me feel uh, fulfilled, really. Like I'm actually doing something. And if I got hit by a bus tomorrow, hopefully not. At least I've done a few things and tried to help a few other people. And that's and it, really. You've left you know, already you know, such a huge legacy. I mean, oh, thanks, your, your story already is just so inspiring. Like I say, me and Tom, from the last time we met, you know, spoke spoke for days and weeks about you and your, all your achievements and it's so amazing to hear now that that's the one thing i've missed since since there's lockdown and i've not been able to go and give motivational talks it, it's i've missed not having that impact on people to kind yeah. of plant that seed and, and the seeds that you're planting it's just absolutely amazing because i know where i grew up i grew up in bootle Again, it's, it's, I think it's one of the most deprived areas in the UK, and, and for sure, we didn't have any anyone like you coming in saying, "Look, guys, you know, you can get out of Bootle, you can go and sail across the world if you want to." So, mate, it's it's amazing to hear your your plans for for twenty twenty two. Oh, thanks, mate. Yeah, hopefully it'll be good. I, it's not going to be easy. I think this pro project is probably going to be the biggest headache I've ever had, but I know it's going to be worth doing. I just got a gut feeling. We need to, um, when all this stuff lifts, we need to get A, you and Tom down to, to go flying. Because I made a commitment when we caught up in person to do did, that. Yeah. <laughs> and now, in another year or the following year, hopefully you'll, you'll still be going and we've now, we'll have more content to talk about with the uh, with oh, yeah. next project. What an incredible thing is, you know, a you know to be either between 18 and 23 and have that opportunity to to yeah. go around like you know in on one of those set, like stages james like what an incredible thing like if whoever gets the opportunity to do that you know is that's what i thought um i'm not advertising i'm not going out there finding these people yet what i'm going to do is i've got a couple of conversations going with some of my sort of existing sponsors and and people that i know once I've got funding in place, I'm already doing the research. I've got my eye on a couple of different boats uh, that, that, I, that I want to try and buy for, for the project. Um, but, and once I've got the funding in place to buy that boat or a boat, and th at that point, I will then go out and engage uh, with, with these people and I'll find them. They're probably all going to be from the UK, to be honest, because it's too difficult to start getting kids from South America and Australia and stuff. They'll all be from the UK, but they'll, they'll sail different legs around the world, mm. uh, basically. And also what I'll do is I'll put them all through their RYA, which is the Royal Yachting Association. I'll put them all through their sailing courses. So they'll come out of it with a qualified sailor with <laughs> quite a lot of experience. And, and, and one of the things that I'm quite excited about is one of my that sponsors is a company called Barrett Homes, which you all probably all know well. And they do quite a lot of stuff with um, ex-offenders. So I'm kind of hoping in, in, a, in, in an ideal world, these people will come on board the project, they'll have a great time. Maybe it'll work for some of them, maybe it won't, won't for some of them, I don't know. But for the ones that do come away, feeling that like they've really got something out of it, uh, that the, there'll be an opportunity for them to go to go into work and, and, and go get pick up some work with some of the sponsors that have backed the project because mm. they've already proved that they've got what it takes they've got uh, determination commitment the ability to see something through all the things that they need because they've had to have demonstrated those things to have been selected to, to sell around the world and then hopefully they'll be able to slide into a job with one of my sponsors whether it be DHL or, or Barrett Homes, or both companies do take on ex-offenders and give people a chance. That would be the idea. Because someone said to me the other day, well, this is a really great idea. I like what you're doing. But what happens at the end? And that's when I said to them, well, this is what, in an ideal world, what will happen at the end is they'll, they'll go off and work for some of the partners that back the project. Or they'll go off and do their own thing. Well, the most important thing is they go the right way. Yeah, they've just yeah. had their eyes opened into something that they would never have had before. And, and that in yeah. itself is, is worth its weight in gold. Their mindset and their view on life. And, and there's, they'll have that sense of, you know, wow, maybe I can do more than I thought. And 
even if it only works for a few of them, it's, it will be worth it. In a roundabout way, it's, you said something at the very start, which was how I feel about listening to what you're, you're about to do. And, you know, when you said um, flying around the world, you know, it's, it's an expensive kind of thing, you know, a hobby to be, have a helicopter and stuff. And I remember growing up where I grew up, um, no one even mentioned a skiing holiday. Like, skiing was just not learning to ski and going on holiday to France or to Switzerland or Italy. It just was a, it was a no-go. I didn't even know it was a thing that people from where I lived could go skiing. I joined the Marines and I, you know, now I'm a competent skier. I've skied all over the world now. If someone had said to me, you know, as a kid, we'll take you skiing, it would have been the best thing in the world just to open my eyes. And again, what you're doing with that opportunity, we'll take you sailing. If that time's 100, you know what I mean? And that's why it's so important to, to, to open people's eyes who, who normally, you know, you know, the types of people you're talking about in, in that age group, uh, who, like you say, might have just got involved in the wrong thing just because of circumstance. You just don't know. To open their eyes is, is huge because it's, you don't know what you don't know, do you? Do you know what I mean? And it's, it's, it's that amazing Absolutely. thing. You could really yeah, change yeah, someone's yeah. life. Yeah, hopefully. We'll have some fun along the way as well. <laughs> hey, can I, can I just ask, because we're, we're at a perfect sort of like um, insight into what you go through for a project. So obviously it's the 10th of April now, 2020. And you're, and I, 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 hopefully, obviously, I know you haven't made this public, so I don't want to, you know, maybe spoil some things that you shouldn't talk about. But so what does that look? And you, you have mentioned it a second ago of um, getting sponsorship and that sort of thing. So this project now about sailing the work around the world, what happens for the next two years? Is it just a drive to try and find as many sponsors? Cause I suppose money solves a lot of problems for you in terms of buying a boat. Like what does the next two years look like then in terms of a timeline? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, so the next two years, the main thing, is to start getting some funding on board but because i'm looking for such a large amount of funding i have to have already done a lot of research when i go to these people because they're going to ask a shitload of different questions so i have to have uh, a pretty thorough budget already worked out to what i think this is going to cost um i have to have a plan of how it's going to look uh for for the young people that i'm bringing on board the boat a plan for them um, I ha there's, there's also different, there's many different routing options as well. So I need to look at the different routing options. I need to look at the different time of year to, to go around. I also then need to look at how are we going to maximize it? Are we going to try and put it all out and just on, on YouTube? Or are we going to try and go out and pitch for a, a broadcaster to come on board? But then there's complications around sponsors logos being showed and, and all sorts of difficult things with that um and then i need to start doing some training in it myself because because oh, i can sail i've sailed across the atlantic as well um but nowhere near enough experience to to take some people away at the moment so i need to to get some other people around me who can help me bring my game up uh, a lot um and uh, yeah, I'll need to find somewhere to put the damn thing, whether it's down in Southampton or where, or Portsmouth, wherever it is. And then, and then I need to have put together a really nice sort of business plan. You can't just, when you're trying to work on a project like this, you can't just flick through a one page PDF document to the CEO of a company to say, uh, can you put half a million quid into this project? We're going to sell around the world and help some kids. So once I've finished writing the book, uh, everything I do will be geared around this. And it will be uh, mainly, a lot of it will be mainly trying to, to, to get funding in place. You are right. If, 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 if a guy came along now and said, I love this, I'll underwrite the whole lot. Here's a million quid. There'd still be a lot, a lot of work to do. Mm. Uh, but the hardest part would have been ticked. Yeah. So that's really, it's research, 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 um, trying to acquire the right bits, getting the funding in place. Um, 
And also as well, I wanted to take some younger people, but then for insurance purposes, well, you can't because if they're if they're 18, that ruled out taking any purposes. You start taking minors who are under 18, it overcomplicates things. Um, You'd want to be able to buy them beer as well when you stopped off, so you need to go over the beer. Exactly, we do, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, they're just it's no different to any other person running a business, to be honest. It's your life. You're constantly thinking, who can I speak to? How can I do that? And that's, that's it. I mean, I, like for instance, next week, uh, I've got a meeting with a, a charity, a sailing charity, to discuss this project. Um, and so, yeah, um, it's just, the, the honest reality is a lot of the next two years will just be, in some ways quite exciting because it's like research but it will just literally be sat here at this desk emailing that person emailing that person is that person going to sponsor x amount of money if they are great can i send you an invoice are you going to pay it because just someone agreeing to give you money it doesn't really mean much until it's in the bank i mean time and time again i've had people lined up and then for whatever reason the money don't turn up and they don't hear from them again, and it's, mm. it's quite hard. <laughs> but it, I suppose everyone will be doing it if it wasn't, you know. That, that organization bit for me, I, I don't know if you're the same. You mentioned about just sat there doing emails, but, you know, for it's whenever, boring after a while. <laughs> but to be honest, I actually quite enjoy it. It's like when I was organizing when I got married last June. So obviously the day was brilliant. I wouldn't support the organization before and like the planning and things like that, I quite enjoy. I'm surprised you, you didn't enjoy that. I don't mind it, but some, I'd rather be out doing. Yeah, but yeah. the good thing is, with this next project, I'm budget. I'm factoring in uh, a salary to to bring one or two people on board the project full time that can help uh, with with all that stuff, basically. So it's not just me on my own. <laughs> I'll have someone kind of helping me with the the admin side of things, because uh, I I actually would like to spend my time out there being with people and doing mm. it but it's you can't always do the things that you love to do you have yeah. to do things that you don't like to do as well in order to do the things that you do like to do so it's just one of those yeah. things yeah we'll have to get you down for that as well i'll keep you updated oh yeah definitely mate yeah 100 percent. And, and and i don't know if there's any more things to add but what i will just say is um mate you can i think when you were um uh, flying around the world your aim was to inspire uh, a million kids wasn't it if i remember correctly it was yeah and, and after me and andy had um had, had been down there i mean look you inspired me to do paramotoring which i would have been doing in two days so you know thank you it's so much yeah <laughs> and obviously andy you know potentially rowing with uh with ian who we got blown up with so um mate you've got a really uh you had on a is Ian the guy who's already rode the Atlantic twice? No, 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 that was another movie. Oh, okay. Yeah. Has Ian already rode the Atlantic then? No, no, no. Okay, so the two of you are up for doing it together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the plan. <laughs> okay, you you heard it here first. <laughs> and he's gonna row the Atlantic. That's like, fantastic. Going on what Tom's saying as well, mate. It's uh, not only have you no doubt inspired more than a million kids, but me and Tom are really inspired. And again, you've you've massively inspired me as well. So to give back more as well, I think that idea that you've got with the the you know young people in, in a couple of years' time is that in itself is really inspired. And I think one thing I spoke about yesterday um, to a friend was about things you've learned during lockdown. And one thing I want to try and do more of is. Um, it's one thing everyone's learned during lockdown is loneliness is not a nice thing. You know, a lot of people out there are lonely right now. And I definitely want to try and do more for maybe old generations when the time is right, you know, yeah. to combat loneliness because it's a horrible thing being alone and not speaking to anyone. And, and again, it's just having, you know, putting actions into what we're going through now and the things that we're learning and loneliness has, has been a big thing that has kind of impacted me. And, listening to you mate and, and giving back and that sense of, you know, helping people in whatever way you can it is so inspiring to hear. And it's, it's kind of reinforced my, my kind of need of wanting to do something, something for people. So, and I'm sure people listening to me will get that as well. So, so massive thanks again. 
No worries, man. I, I always really enjoy chatting with you guys. We always chat for ages as well. We've been like an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is like a thing that we've sort of thrown together online. If we were in person, it would be... Uh, we'd probably the next be time we catch up, it's going to have to be for a beer. I can hear some extra stories if you're traveling, I think. Hey, I've, I've got loads of extra stories for you. So, <laughs> he's got a new channel. <laughs> James, just before we go, I, I, I put something on Instagram and I think a few people had a few questions. So let me just quickly um, yeah. pull this up one second. Uh, right. So best and worst place you visited when flying around the world? Oh, that's really hard because I can't label a place the worst. Otherwise, it just doesn't feel right. There was no worst place. There were places, uh, oh, oh, it was all amazing. Um, Russia, was, Russia was the best. Russia was crazy. Uh, but so was America. Um, the, we won't go with worst, but let's go with the most standard. And what I was used to would probably be like Europe. Europe was nice, um, but the flying, you know, it's fairly straightforward. But Russia and America, oh, and coming back across Greenland was the best. Just amazing. <laughs> yeah. It's a, that's quite a hard one. It is, yeah, yeah. Um, what was the weirdest thing you saw from the air? Weirdest thing I saw from the air... Uh, I saw loads of, it's not really weird. Uh, I saw, I saw a lot of fantastic wildlife. I saw big brown bears in Siberia. Uh, they're only on one day though. I uh, flew over whales, uh, as, wow. in, as in huge whales. Wow. Uh, they, that, was, that was amazing. Um, aha. Okay. So I'm flying down uh, the coast of California. Actually, it's a little bit further north. I think I was in Oregon. And um, there was all these guys in these beach buggies, right? So these guys thought they had these really cool boys toys, like big old quad type things, dune buggies. And they're racing along on the sand, yeah? But I saw them and I was flying very, very low level. And I came up uh, almost level with them as in, like I was very low, only maybe 10 feet off the, the deck, off, off the ground. And I just came flying past them, waving at them as, <laughs> I, as I went past. So that was, that was pretty cool. Um, wasn't, and uh, I'm trying to think of the most unusual things that I saw. I saw lots of uh, interesting patterns um, over some of the fields and things when I flew across uh, the great sort of plains in America. That was, that was quite interesting. But for a lot of the trip, I flew quite low uh, because it, it was a bit more exciting. I could see a bit more and you get more of a sense of speed that you're traveling. When you fly high up, it's just like looking on Google Maps, to be honest. It's not, you may as well just open Google Maps up and have a look. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then did you ever question your ability, your aircraft ability to get you home? No, the aircraft was incredible so you have to have the mindset now some people would say well that's a little bit silly but you have to have this mindset that the engine's never going to stop because as soon as you think that there's a chance that it could it plays tricks on your mind the only problem i had with my aircraft was a puncture i got a puncture on the front wheel in poland and um so i had to sort that out that was a bit of a pain actually because i couldn't get the punch it was a bank holiday and i couldn't get the puncture repaired uh, in Poland and it sounds really crazy and like well, you had to do that just to get your puncture repaired but I flew from Warsaw to Milan just to swap out a wheel and tire and then came back I, on a commercial flight that is yeah. then I came back to swap out the tire and then carried on so that was the only thing that happened that aircraft never missed a beat it was it was you know sometimes in life when you think maybe that was meant to be I, I guess maybe it was meant to be. Yeah. I, I saw on the, on the, on the vlogs that you were doing, which, which were, were excellent by the way, is um, in, I think it was in the U S um, you nearly got caught in a thunderstorm and you were flying with someone else. Yeah, 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 yeah. I had to, we actually, we had to land. So um, basically 
what actually happened was we were only like 10 miles from our finished destination for, for that day. We were crossing into the Canadian border from Alaska and in front of us, the cloud had started to, to, to drop and thicken up and become quite dark and it was raining. And then a, a big bolt of lightning struck down in front. And then, and so we thought we can't carry on into that. So we're going to have to turn back round. But as we turn back round, it, it, it all closed in behind us. So we had no choice but to land on a road. And this was crazy. Luckily, the road was like in the middle of nowhere. So there was no busy cars going up and down. It's not like landing on the M25. And so we landed on this road and then we taxied into a truck stop. And it was like a scene out of a James Bond film. You know, people were just looked up and saw these two gyros come taxiing in and it's like what the hell is that it was that was quite interesting yeah and did you have to take off from that same obviously from the same road you, you landed on yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Took off. the next day we, we packed the gyros up we put the cover on and then um we actually got a lift off an american couple that were cruising around the country in their like rv and they gave us a lift to a hotel and then the next day we went back and took off from the road but the next day when we took off from the road, they had to stop the traffic because there was more. I've got all that on video, actually. It was incredible. That's what I think is the most, the kind of, I'd say, is kind of pub talk or beer talk. You know, just those little chance meetings with people and you just kind of like, this is, I, I love all that. Like, that for me would be the best thing about it. Just, you know, the, you're meeting up with random people and it's just, you, you spend a brief 24 hours with them and you'll never see them again. But it was just a crazy moment. and. Yeah, I've had quite a few of them, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. No, that was it, that was it. That was it, mate, yeah. Maybe we need to get this beer sorted ASAP. I want to hear these. I could talk to you all day, James. Honestly, I think it's... Actually, I've got a story that is right up your street. And this happened <laughs> with another guy who was a, uh, an ex-Marine as well. And he's rode the Atlantic. And this happened in a hotel in Singapore. That's all I can say. I'll leave the actual story for when we get together. It was crazy. <laughs> crazy. <That's good>. Yeah. <laughs> Not awesome, mate. Yeah, thanks so much, James. It was great, great right. to, great to speak. Always, uh, yeah, I love chatting to you guys. It's good, good fun. Yeah, thank you, mate. Any, anything you want to say before we, uh, before we start? Or? Yeah, thank you. If, People have listened right to the end. Thank you for taking the time to, to listen to me and, and you guys today. And thank you for making the effort in, for setting all this up and making this possible. And um, yeah, and in uh, about six months time, I'll have a new book out. And I think I'm going with Chasing Extremes. I think I'm going to call it Chasing Extremes. Uh, or, or I think I mentioned this to you last time. I was thinking about going with It's All Mental. Because I love that whole, it's all mental. Everything you do in life is mental. But there's too much of a grey area between mental and it could be misunderstood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if what anyone is listening, like... what do they prefer? It's all mental or chasing extremes? Um, yeah. But thank you for having me today, guys. And yeah, I hope you have a fantastic Easter. And uh, we'll, we'll catch up really soon when things get back to normal. Brilliant. Awesome. Thank you, James. Really appreciate it, mate.